Hello and welcome to episode 43 of the Paranormal Nothing Podcast. I'm Juan Quiroz and I'll be your host once again. Thank you for joining me. Uh, it's been a few weeks since our last episode on the UFOs in the Middle East, particularly the 1976 case of uh, Ter- Tehran, Iran, um, of a UFO uh, saw being seen over the city of Tehran and a couple of uh, jet fighters sent off by the Iranian government to chase it, uh, to no avail. And a lot of documentation involved in that case. I hope you everybody enjoyed it. And um, there is definitely going to probably, that might, that case probably might come up again uh, very soon uh, due to the fact of the, uh, again, this UFO report, which recently I did hear um, that the classified version of the report is roughly 16 pages long. So the unclassified version that we were given on June 25th is uh, about eight pages long. The unclassified is about double. So does that mean that it contains double amount of data or is it just more of the same type of data where uh, the government knows that UFOs are out there? They've acknowledged that there there is a phenomena called an identified aerial phenomena um, and they're leaving that door open for it to potentially be um, aliens or not, you know. So is it more of that or is it more of actual admission that maybe we know more than uh, what we're being told? So who knows? Who knows what, what that will entail? But um, we'll see. We'll see what comes of that. In today's episode, I wanted to veer off a little bit from the, uh, the what I've been doing lately with the uh, UFO talks, um, UFO cases. So uh, again, I've kind of covered the Nordics, uh, again, the tall white aliens in episode 41. And then I covered the Frederick Valentik case in episode 40. And then in episode 39, we talked about the uh, aliens and and the demonic aspect of them. Um, 38, we talked about the reptilians and so forth. So a lot of extraterrestrial UFO alien centered episodes. Hope you've enjoyed those. But today we're going to veer into something a little bit more of a uh, I would say on the fairy tale side, or I would even, maybe even on the, I guess you could call them cryptids, although I, I tend not to want to use that word. Um, I guess it's more of the uh, paranormal history, I guess would be the correct term for today's episode. So today's episode, we're going to talk about a, a case of a couple of kids that um, apparently uh, showed up out of nowhere in this little village called Woolpit in England. And uh, these kids had green skin and they behaved pretty weird. So we're going to talk about that case and about uh, what, you know, what, what kind of evidence is there about, you know, that, that kind of tells us that maybe there is more to the story than just a legend or a fable. So uh, the story again is from the Middle Ages and it took place in Woolpit, England. So anything that takes place in Middle Ages England, I think, is rife with, uh, you know, peasant superstition, with uh, just uh, all kinds of details that go hand in hand with stories that came out during that time about kings and, ke- and queens and, and dragons and uh, uh, wizards and, and that kind of thing. So we're going to go ahead and uh, get into this episode and see uh, what kind of uh, accuracy, what kind of veridicity, what kind of, uh, could it be, again, that there really were these children that came out and appeared in this city out of nowhere, and uh, what happened to them? So let's get into that now. So to start our analysis, or our, um, not not the analysis, but what I want to do is kind of tell you why it is that I decided to talk about this case today. And um, I came upon a meme, um, a meme or an image recently on the internet uh, where uh, this case was kind of described as being that out of nowhere, uh, two kids appeared in the city of Woolpit uh, during the Middle Ages and um, they appeared to not speak English. They said they were, um, they, people said again that they just kind of came out from a wolf pit, and we'll get into what what that means. And um, when they walked out of the wolf pit, almost like uh, Alice in Wonderland, 
kind of going through the, um, again, kind of like the, 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 the wormhole and um, coming out in, in a whole other dimension on the other side. And uh, w when these kids came out of this wolf pit, they uh, basically said, or they, they didn't speak the correct uh, language of the region. And they were dressed very oddly. They behaved very oddly. And uh, more than anything, they had green skin. So that's kind of the basis of the story. So the reason that that's one of the reasons why I decided to talk about it. Another another reason that I thought about when I was looking at this image, uh, this just a very one page graphic on on this story, um, it reminded me of a movie called The Life of Timothy Green. It came out a few years ago. Uh, I, th I think it's a Disney movie, but it stars Jennifer Gardner. And um, she plays a mom uh, to a child who, uh, uh, her and her husband are having trouble having kids. This is, this is spoiler alert, I'm going to just basically tell you a little bit about the story, if, if you haven't seen it. Um, so her and her husband are having trouble having kids, and uh, one rainy evening, they kind of make some kind of uh, pact or promise um, write it on a piece of paper, or the, they like a wish actually. And uh, this piece of paper, they bury it in the ground as if you're kind of planting a seed. Uh, but instead of planting a seed, they bury this piece of paper that contains the wish that they're making uh, for whatever it is that they're wishing for, uh, which is obviously for a child. They're wishing to be able to have a child. Um, and they write on there all the different traits that they wish that this child would have, like being athletic, being very smart, um, having long hair, having blue eyes. I mean, it, it's kind of like a whole uh, wish list of what their ideal child would be like. So that evening, as the rain soaks this paper buried underneath the soil, miraculously, a few hours later, uh, they hear a knock on their door, and here's this child uh, who appears to be maybe nine, ten years old. So he's in. He comes out from the middle of nowhere. They live out in the country, um, and he is basically there at their doorstep. And he's um, he kind of is he's embodying everything that they wish for. And little by little, they start realizing that he is basically the um, the embodiment, the projection of whatever they wrote on that piece of paper. Uh, so, so these stories of children kind of appearing out of nowhere is kind of what interested me. So this is kind of a, a movie, obviously, and, and obviously this child, um, he he kind of has leaves that grow on his legs, kind of a symbol of that he is part of the earth or comes from the earth. And uh, in the story, little by little, uh, as the leaves that are on his legs, as they fall off just with time, once the last leaf falls off, you know what's going to happen next, uh, what's going to happen to this child. So, But the whole point is that they, this child teaches this couple about what it is to be parents and uh, what it is to not necessarily uh, want everything perfect in a kid, but more more about just being a good parent. So that's that's kind of a connection to the story. On a more ominous side, it kind of also reminded me a bit about the uh, Black Eyed Kids. It was one of my very first episodes of this podcast where we talked about the Black Eyed Kids phenomena kind of appearing out of nowhere. Um, ki kids knocking on doors, appearing to act very oddly, uh, having all black eyes, sometimes having very pale skin, uh, speaking in a very robotic voice, behaving very robotically, um, asking, of course, to come inside. So that's the uh, the black eyed kids phenomena. So it also reminded me of that part. Um, so you have kind of the both sides of the spectrum where this movie and now the black eyed kids. And of course, we have to have some historicity with with this phenomena of children appearing out of nowhere. So and again, in the in the case of Timothy Green, he had leaves which were kind of on his feet, which made him a little bit odd. Um, in the case of the uh, black eyed kids, of course, we've got the all black eyes again and their behavior. And at times, again, they had pale skin. And then in the story again of the Woolpit children, 
the story says that these kids had green skin. Well, do we have any other examples where maybe families also kind of had some kind of trait like this or, or children? So there actually is a case, uh, the Fugates. The Fugates were a country uh, or a family from uh, Kentucky. And um, I'm going to read you kind of what, what it's, what is, what uh, Wikipedia, Wikipedia is pretty good for very, very basic uh, fact checking on these kinds of stories. And again, I like to use Wikipedia, uh, not necessarily exactly Wikipedia, but the sources that Wikipedia references. So the Fugates, and I've heard of this story before, uh, were a family that lived in the hills of Kentucky, and they were commonly known as the Blue Fugates, or the Blue People of Kentucky. Um, they're notable for having been carriers of a genetic trait that led to the blood disorder methomyoglobinemia. Let me repeat that again. Methomoglobinia, which causes the appearance of blue tinged skin. So if you, if you look up the uh, blue fugates, you'll see a large family without being, again, uh, disrespectful. It kind of reminded me of the Smurfs. If you're familiar with that show, the Smurfs, they have that tone of skin. It's just, it's very bizarre. And if you read a little bit about him, uh, what happened was that it is due to um, inbreeding uh, caused this um, mutation, a genetic mutation that led to this blood disorder, a very rare blood disorder, which again causes uh, blue ting skin. And um, so again, we've got some situations where, yeah, may, may, you know, this, this has happened um, in the past where an individual could have a skin that's blue. Um, even... Again, even in, again, when you think about uh, people think, saying your skin is a little blue, obviously, when we have a, a very, very cold or you could be when you're very, you know, when you're sick or uh, you tend to be very pale, sometimes you might have a bluish uh, hint to your skin. But what about greenish skin? Again, when you think of green skin, you think of being sick, right? You think of, uh, without being, again, crude, you think of vomit. Uh, you think of garbage sometimes, uh, but you could also think of a freshness. You could think of springtime. Again, I think of the story I just mentioned, the life of Timothy Green, uh, where he had leaves. He was he was leaves on his feet. He was um, essentially brand new from the earth. So I think there's some a deeper meaning to to the story of the Woolpit children. But that's kind of where I I started at uh, by think thinking about this case is. What kinds of connections can we make to other stories and both fiction and both in, in possibly some historical stories where we have these types of cases appearing? So let's talk about the, the city now, a city called Woolpit. So Woolpit is a very, very small village, uh, again, in, in Suffolk County, England. And if you look at a map, uh, it still exists, Woolpit, but it was, it's a very, very old city from the 10th century. So, Woolpit itself is, is about 91 miles northeast of London, okay? So, if you've been to London, not that far away from London, about an hour and a half drive from London, and it's about 40 miles away from the nearest uh, coast of the English Channel, just due east of it. So, it's not that far away either from the sea. In 2011, 2011, uh, 10 years ago, Woolpit had a population of 1,995 people. That is a very, very small city. I live in LA, and uh, that's, that's basically like two uh, city blocks uh, worth of people. So this is a whole city, very, very small population. Now, uh, back in the 10th century, uh, we could only imagine, again, the, the population there. So a very small city, of course, and... Uh, the city, the city itself, Woolpit, is spelled W-O-O-L-P-I-T. And that's the first time we actually hear it recorded in English history is in the 10th century. And the name itself, Woolpit, Wolf, Wolf, Wolf it kind of comes from the another term, an old English term, Woolpit, uh, W-L-F-P-Y-T-T. So Wolf is kind of the word in there that uh, they pay attention um, to pay attention to, it, it literally means a pit for trapping wolves. So that's where the name, uh, the city gets its name, 
uh, because of the, the wolf pits that are prevalent in the city. And this is where one of these, this is where the children actually uh, first are, are seen when they actually come out of the wolf pits. And again, it's a very small town. Um, according to Wikipedia, again, you have a couple of fairs, city fairs that happen throughout the year. You have a mill, and it's now known for brick making. So, however, it, it is, it, it, again, it lays within a very highly dense agricultural zone. Um, and it's a densely populated area of rural England. So, although it's not very, very populated, in rural England, it's basically considered highly populated. So, um, but again, we're talking about 2011 in the 10th century. I could only imagine again uh, when when we first see Wolf Pit, Wolf, Wolf Pit, which became Wolf Pit, uh, being talked about. Um, you could imagine again; it would have been very, very um, not densely populated. So, the story itself, though, the story of the Wolf Pit children, um, that did that did not happen in the 10th century. That we don't we don't hear about that coming from the 10th century. Uh, we start hearing about this story. Um, in the 12th century, so a couple of hundred years later, that's when we start uh, he seeing this story. And the reason we know that it occurred at that time is because in 1850, there was a, a book uh, called The Fairy Mythology, and it was written by Thomas Cately. And Thomas Cately, uh, he, it, it's this entire compendium. You could actually find it on the uh, Project Gutenberg on the internet, uh, and uh, you can you can find the entire uh, manuscript that contains a lot of pretty cool little uh, myths, mythologies. But on page eighty, on page two eighty one of that fairy mythology, this is where we first hear about in contemporary times. Uh, we first hear about the green children. So I want to read you what what uh, Thomas Cately says. Uh, about the green children, and I want you to pay attention to a couple of names uh, that he uses for his sources. So this is what he says, in, Thomas Cately says in the fairy mythology on page 281. He says, quote, Another wonderful thing, says Ralph of Cogsoul, happened in Suffolk, at St. Mary's of the Wolf Pits. A boy and his sister were found by the inhabitants of that place, near the mouth of a pit, which is there, who had the form of all their limbs like to those of other men, but they differed in the color of their skin from all the people of their habitable world, for the whole surface of their skin was tinged of a green color. No one could understand their speech. When they were brought as curiosities to the house of a certain knight, Sir Richard de Calne, at Wykes, they wept bitterly. Bread and other victuals were set before them, but they would touch none of them, though they were tormented by great hunger, as the girl afterwards acknowledged. At length, when some beans just cut with their stalks were brought into the house, they made signs with great avidity that they should be given to them. When they were brought, they opened the stalks instead of the pods, thinking the beans were in the hollow of them, but not finding them there, they began to weep anew. When those who were present saw this, they opened the pods and showed them the naked beans. They fed on these with great delight, and for a long time tasted no other food. The boy, however, was always languid and depressed, and he died within a short time. The girl enjoyed continual good health, and being accustomed to various kinds of foods, lost completely that green color, and gradually recovered the sanguine habit of her entire body. She was afterwards regenerated by the laver of holy baptism and lived for many years in the service of that knight, as I have frequently heard from him and his family, and was rather loose and wanton in her conduct. Being frequently asked about the people of her country, she asserted that the inhabitants and all that, that, that had in that country were of a green color, and that they saw no sun, but enjoyed a degree of light like what is after sunset. Being asked how she came into this country with the aforesaid boy, she replied that as they were following their flocks, they came to a certain cavern, on entering which they heard a delightful sound of bells, ravished by those 
ravished by whose sweetness, they went for a long time wandering on through the cavern until they came to its mouth. When they came out of it, they were stuck, struck senseless by the excessive light of the sun and the unusual temperature of the air, and they thus lay for a long time. Being terrified by the noise of those who came on them, they wished to fly, but they could not find the entrance of the cavern before they were caught. So there you go. Um, that's the account of the children uh, based on one Ralph of Cogshall. Co Cogs or Cogshall. I believe that's how you, you might pr pronounce his name. And um, that's one of the, um, the accounts. So there are two accounts, basically, um, that this individual, Th Thomas Cately, in the fairy mythology, uh, talks about as having been the basis for uh, the story. And um, a, lot, a lot to unpack there, uh, this particular story. There's a lot, actually, a lot of kind of parallels to, um, to something of the uh, intradimensional nature. So, in terms of the uh, intradimensional nature of this account, I think it's pretty interesting that, as I mentioned, there's actually two accounts of this story. Uh, one appears for, again, it's Ralph Cogshall, Cogshall and uh, the name of the uh, uh, document that this appears in, and again, Thomas Cately presents it in 1850, but the name of the original document, it's called the Chronicum Anglicanum, uh, Latin and there actually is another account of the story. And before I, I talk a little bit about the analysis, the other account of the story is, is written by one William of Newber. Um, and again, it's also presented, talked about a bit by Thomas Cately, but it was actually presented six years later more in depth by one Joseph Stevenson. And this particular um, account of the story appears in a document of the time called Historia Rerum Anglicarum. So once again, we're talking Latin as well. And um, the stories themselves, you can do a, a, look, a search for those stories. And um, they, they basically are um, written in Latin. So if you speak Latin, you can, you can understand the stories very, fairly easily. Um, but there are some English translations out there. And what's interesting is that uh, both stories, uh, although they are they they agree for the most part on on what exactly was um, what happened with the, with the with the children, they were written um, a few miles apart from each other. One in Suffolk and one in Norfolk, as I had mentioned. The Suffolk one was again the Cogshall story, and then the Newburgh account of the story was written in uh, or originates from Norfolk. Um, the story itself, again for uh, from Newburgh. Is a little bit different, although it it coincides for the most part with that of uh, Cogshar. But I want to read you the story as well from William of Newburgh. And again, this was allegedly uh, written a few miles from the original story, um, and uh, but it was presented about six years after the William of Cogshire um, account, and that was again uh, in in eighteen. I'm sorry. Ralph of Cogshall uh, account, and that was presented in 1850. So six years difference, uh, but we've got the Cogshall account is, mm, I would say, probably closer to the time of the events, not by much. Uh, we're talking six years difference, Ralph of Cogshall. Uh, but the story itself of the children took place again in the 12th century. So we're talking 606, 600, you know, plus or minus six years difference uh, between the time that the story actually took place and the time that we're hearing about them by Thomas Cately and again um, shortly after that by uh, Joseph Stevenson. So this is the account of the story will, written by William of Newburgh in uh, Historia Rerum Anglicarum. And it goes like this. Nor does it seem right to pass over an unheard of prodigy, which as is well known, took place in England during the reign of King Stephen. Though it is asserted by many, yet I have long been in doubt concerning the matter, and deemed it ridiculous to give credit to a circumstance supported on no rational foundation, or at least one of a mysterious character, 
Yet at length I was so overwhelmed by the weight of so many and such competent witnesses that I have been compelled to believe, and I wonder, over a matter which I was unable to comprehend or unravel by any powers of intellect. So I want to just stop there for a second. It's interesting that this particular account of the story starts with kind of a disclaimer, saying that the author um, heard, the, heard about these stories and investigated them and found no lies uh, involved in them, found that they were uh, there was a lot of compelling witnesses to the event. And again, this is, um, again, Joseph Stevenson is talking about it in 1856, but we're talking about an account of the story which allegedly took place uh, the account itself written a few years after the actual event. So here goes the story. It goes, quote, In East Anglia, there is a village distant, as it is said, four or five miles from the noble monastery of the blessed king and martyr Edmund. Near this place are seen some very ancient cavities called wolf pits, that is, in English, pits for wolves, and which give their name to the adjacent village, Wolpet, a market town, during harvest, while the reapers were employed in gathering in the produce of the fields, two children, a boy and a girl, completely green in their persons, and clad in garments of a strange color and unknown materials, emerged from these excavations. While wandering through the fields in astonishment, they were seized by the reapers and conducted to the village, and many persons coming to see so novel a sight, they were kept some days without food. But when they were so nearly exhausted with hunger and yet could relish no species of support which was offered to them, it happened that some beans were brought in from the field, which they immediately seized with avidity and examined the stalk for the pulse, but not finding it in the hollow of the stalk, they wept bitterly. Upon this, one of the bystanders, taking the beans from the pods, offered them to the children, who seized them directly and ate them with pleasure. By this, the food they were supported for many months, until they learned the use of bread. At length, by degrees, they changed their original color through the natural, ef nat natural effect of our food, and became like ourselves, and also learned our language. It seemed fitting to certain discreet persons that, sh that should receive the sacrament of baptism, which was administered accordingly. The boy, who appeared to be the younger, surviving the baptism but a little time, died prematurely. His sister, however, continued in good health, and differed not in the least from the women of her own country. Afterwards, as it is reported, she was married at Lynn and was living a few years since, at least so they say. Moreover, after they had acquired our language, on being asked who and whence they were, they are said to have replied, We are inhabitants of the land of St. Martin, who is regarded with peculiar veneration in the country which gave us birth. Being further asked where that land was, and how they came thence hither, they answered, we are ignorant of both of those circumstances. We only remember this, that on a certain day, when we were feeding on our father's flocks in the fields, we heard a great sound, such as we are now accustomed to hear at St. Edmund's, when the bells are chiming, and whilst listening to the sound in admiration, we became on a sudden as it were entranced and found ourselves among you in the fields where you were reaping. Being questioned whether in that land they believed in Christ, or whether the sun arose, they replied that the country was Christian and possessed churches, but said they, The sun does not rise upon our countrymen. Our land is little cheered by its beams. We are contented with that twilight, which among you precedes the sunrise or follows the sunset. Moreover, a certain luminous country is seen, not far from distant hours, and divided from it by a very considerable river. These and many other matters, too numerous to particularize, they are said to have recounted to curious inquirers. Let every one say as he pleases, and reason on such matters according to his abilities. I feel no regret at having recorded an event so prodigious and miraculous. Unquote. So that is the account, a little longer than the account from uh, Kogshaw. Uh, this is William of Newburgh's account. And just initially, again, we get very, very similar descriptions of the of the children and of how they, which we'll get to in the, our analysis part, uh, about having looking, looking for beans in the stock of the bean plant instead of the pods. Both stories are in agreement with that. Um, but in this story, you get a couple other uh, interesting anecdotes. We get actually a name 
of where the children allegedly come from, right? So the land of St. Martin, which we'll get to later, and that the um, female in the group, that she actually went on to get married, um, and that she had a normal life afterwards, uh, that the children essentially also, uh, once they got used to our food, quote-unquote earth, earth food, uh, if, you, if, if, you know, to, to kind of just use those terms, um, the first thing that they ate was bread. So I think it's interesting, interesting um, anecdotes, interesting details that I think tell you a lot about the story, I think, in this case. So the, the other thing that we hear also is that um, both of these stories, again, originate six years apart but are told, they, they are similar, but they're also actually quite different because uh, one gives you more details. It seems that the one that was allegedly written later, six years later in Norfolk, gives you more details than the one from Suffolk, uh, Cogshaw. So Ralph of Cogshaw and uh, Thomas of Newburgh, written six years apart, presented by Kitely and Stevenson, but give you additional sources. Um, and it also actually tells you the name of the of the girl. Uh, so her name was Agnes Barre, and um, she married again, and uh, she went on to have a normal life, uh, but not much is said after that. So that's basically the story itself. A lot of elements of fantasy, I would say, a lot of elements of uh, mythology, a lot of elements even of some some modern paranormal types of phenomena. So black-eyed kids, for sure. Um, I would even say uh, kind of elements of like feral feral children. So I mean, I'll, get to, I'll get to that in a second in the analysis, but feral children ten, are, are essentially defined as children that are maybe raised by wolves, in a sense, or raised by Mother Nature, um, you know, left in, in the forest, and uh, they were never taught to eat with utensils, use the restroom in the proper location, uh, speak. So they grow up with mimicking um, essentially animals and not mimicking other humans. And we do have quite a few cases. There are a lot of different cases, um, scientifically documented cases of children growing up this way. Or maybe they might have been even raised in a, in a contemporary city setting. But because of abuse, um, they were not given the opportunity to develop normal, quote-unquote, normal human tendencies, human behaviors. Uh, so they grow up just knowing whatever is in their uh, enclosed environment, um, and they weren't taught how to cor um, act correctly. Um, so now that we've talked about the story, again, those are the two stories, and that's how we get the, the Woolpit children story uh, in, in, our, in our modern time. Let's talk a little bit about the story uh, in, on the analysis side, can we actually say that this story did take place? And if it did take place, could it be that these children are truly um, more than meets the eye? So let's now analyze the case and see, um, you know, again, if we can apply the tools of science, the tools of rational thought, the tools of logic, as we've done with other cases that we've uh, discussed on this podcast. So the first thing that I'd, I'd like to make uh, make known about this particular case is that near the uh, the area where the case allegedly took place in Woolpit, and although I haven't mentioned it at, during this show, but according to the story, uh, the case took place uh, roughly around the years um, 1135, um, sometime between 1135 and 1154. So sometime uh, again, the the uh, middle part, early to middle part of the 12th century. That's when we, we know that this case took place. Well, the case itself, again, to, in Woolpit, there's actually a, um, a particular um, statue of the Virgin Mary that is uh, venerated. And um, this particular statue is, uh, call, it, it's, in a, it's in a church called St. Mary's Church. And... Um, it's in an area of the church called the Ladies' Well. And it's usually partially filled with water, and it rises from a natural spring. It's a place of uh, people do pilgrimages to, to visit this particular um, area dedicated to the Virgin Mary. 
And of course, you know, because again, an area of high amount of um, re religiosity, uh, you do get uh, people that are uh, allegedly miraculously uh, cured by bathing in the waters of this um, enclosure, of this moat enclosure uh, within the Church of St. Mary's. So what's interesting to note, though, is that because of the natural spring origin of the water that's entering this particular um, moat, um, it is high in what you would call sulfate. So, and sulfate is actually known to assist in treatment of eye infections, but also a variety of other infections, bacterial infections. So, again, I, I, I myself am Catholic. I believe, again, in, in mir there, are, there are, in my opinion, legitimate miracles. But I'm also a person of science, and I really feel that, um, in this case, for example, um, you might you might more easily attribute the uh, healings that happened in the waters of St. Mary's well, um, probably more to the sulfate contact, content in the natural spring water that flows into it, uh, more so than the uh, attribution to a miracle. So, with that said, let's apply that same kind of logic and, and rational thought to, to the story of the Woolpit children. So, let's start now with... A, a an explanation of the case of the of the children from a I guess you could call a paranormal standpoint. So if we think about it from a paranormal standpoint, these children do show quite a few different um, I would say uh, projections or characteristics of having literally gone through a wormhole, I guess or a, or an interdimensional portal. So we, they do say that they come from a land where the sun is dimmer. Uh, they come from a land where people have green skin. Um, and they come from a land, a magical land, called St. Martin. Now, near Woolpit, near England, there is no such place called St. Martin. Um, where, where did that come from? You know, the, the children themselves, they actually admit that they don't know where that is. Um, they say that they themselves... Um, don't don't know exactly. They're they're ignorant. Let, to quote again the story, they say we are ignorant of the circumstances of where Saint Martin is or where they come from. Uh, we only remember that on a certain day when we were feeding on our father's flocks in the fields, we heard a great sound, such as now are accustomed to hear at Saint Edmund's when the bells are chiming. So I think that says a lot. If you think I mean, in terms of paranormal. Um, hearing a great sound and all of a sudden you're transported into a whole other world. Almost like you're hearing a tearing in the uh, space-time continuum. Uh, we, we, do, we have heard situations like that where individuals hear loud sounds and, 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 and uh, frequencies and uh, pitches and uh, different, different at attributes of sound itself can actually influence human behavior. Of course, we know about infrasound, um, and then kind of its connection to the whole um, uh, Dyatlov Pass incident. Uh, we we even now, you know, unfortunately, this Havana syndrome situation where you have high pitched pulses of of energy, um, and sound again could be can kind of considered energy because you it actually can move things at at a certain if you um, you know it could shatter windows right at a certain pitch. So it is a form of energy. Um, it is actually very powerful. Um, could there be a sound created or a sound originating from something that could actually tear uh, and make a space-time continuum tear to actually transport these kids from whatever other dimension or planet or realm they came from, all of a sudden they're, in, they're on Earth? Um, it could happen. Okay, I'm not saying it can't. We, again, we also know about quantum physics. Uh, of course, Schrodinger's cat, and of course, we talk. We know about quantum entanglements. There are a lot of things like that, and if if such if such uh, events were to happen, of course, you know we're talking about the Middle Ages, things like that occurring to an individual, a group of a group of individuals during the Middle Ages would definitely seem like science. Would definitely seem like magic. Um, now we we know a little bit more. Uh, we're, we're now we're getting into the realms of. Uh, Quantum mechanics being able to explain things such as consciousness, um, such as uh, even near-death experiences, 
uh, things like uh, spooky action at a distance. You know, all of these all of these topics are now being used to explain what things uh, allegedly appear to us to be maybe paranormal or maybe not as paranormal as we thought. So could it be again that these children happen to fall into a tear in the space-time continuum were transported through some kind of wormhole or some time of some type of portal that's scientifically based because again we do know that wormholes do exist uh, and and the more and more we hear about the possibility of parallel universes or other dimensions we know we know about string theory which requires 10 dimensions of 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 existence in order to actually work and we know that string theory mathematics is legitimate so could there be 10 dimensions? Uh, we're, we're only able to perceive four of those dimensions, us humans here on Earth. Could be. Could be the case. And again, I like to speculate, and I'm, I'm just brainstorming, thinking out loud for, for your benefit, for your sake. Um, so let's, let's keep that in mind. You know, could, it be, could they have fallen through something like this where um, variations in, in, what, in how they perceive things, these children... Variations in skin color, in behavior, in um, geography, in um, even food sources. All of this might have been present in whatever other version of reality they came from. Uh, but here on Earth, obviously, it was a little bit different. So could this be even be proof that every other parallel reality has a little bit of variation uh, if such a thing did happen? Let's just consider that for now. But now let's talk about a more, I guess you could say, mundane explanation, or you could even call it a more uh, explanation more based on rational thought. So, of course, we know that there are, as I had mentioned at the beginning of today's episode, there are some conditions, diseases brought about by various things that can cause the skin to turn a different color. It happens to be that there actually is a condition for um, for green green skin, and it's actually called hydrochromic anemia. So, what is hydrochromic anemia? Essentially, it is um, uh, another term for it. Some people call it chlorosis. So, to kind of use Wikipedia again, Wikipedia is pretty good for for these kinds of things. Uh, chlorosis, um, it's also known as green sickness. Ironically, is a distinct skin ting some skin ting. Um, sometimes present in patients, in addition to more general symptoms such as a lack of energy, shortness of breath, dyspepsia, headaches, a capricious or scanty appetite, and amenorrhea. So that's that's uh, Wikipedia. So to give you a little bit more idea of what this disease is, I'm going to read you another small paragraph here of what, what it is. Hi hypochromic anemia, once commonly known as chlorosis, is one potential cause of green skin. This condition results in the red blood cells lacking the normal level of hemoglobin that normally gives them their red color. Consequently, people with hypochromic anemia sometimes exhibit a green pallor to their skin. Other symptoms of the condition can include shortness of breath, headaches, lack of appetite, while potential causes, and this is important, include B deficiency, low iron absorption, certain types of infections, or even lead poisoning. Another cause of green skin is bruising, which generally involves internal bleeding into extracellular space within the skin. We know about that. Obviously, sometimes your bruises turn green. If you happen to get injured during some, some kind of activity, you get a kind of a green bruise. So we know that. Um, however, um, if, you, if you pay attention to the, to the word, to, to the term hypochromic anemia, the word anemia is in there. Um, if you're again, if you've ever experienced anemia, maybe if you or if you've known somebody who experienced anemia, it's basically mal mal a type of malnutrition. So we and we know that these children uh, that emerged from these wolf pits, um, they didn't want to eat and they didn't know how to eat um, stalks from beans. They were eating the stalks from the bean. They were trying to find the beans in the stalks uh, rather than in the pods. And uh, that kind of, I'm, I'm not terribly surprised that they didn't know, uh, because maybe, again, these kids were not familiar with uh, how beans grew, grow. But it is strange, though, that these were uh, 
you know, country kids. So you would think that, you know, they grew up in the country, they grew up in farms, they would know about such things. Uh, in this case, they didn't. So either one, they purposefully were not taught, or two, they never just were shown interest on how to how beans grew. So the other thing again, which is interesting and connected to that, is that the way that they perceived that the sun wasn't too bright for where, wherever they came from, which makes me feel that maybe... And it is kind of unfortunate to to think about this particular explanation. Um, they maybe were c kept possibly in some kind of dungeon or some kind of uh, abusive situation where they were not let out into their surroundings to um, experience nature, uh, experience a full sunrise and a full sunset. Um, and again, they were also not fed properly. We're talking about hypochromic anemia, which causes your skin to go green if it is that you aren't being fed properly and as the story says once they began to eat and let me let me actually I'm gonna I want to I want to read it for you directly uh, because I think it's important um, you know again because it says here at length by degrees they changed their original color through the natural natural effect of our food and became like ourselves and also learned our language so the fact that they didn't speak the native language, again, tells me that these were kids, and we do hear cases like this now, even children that are, as I had mentioned, there is a very, very sad case uh, not that far from here in Los Angeles. Um, There's actually a Netflix special made about it, uh, a child that was basically kept in a closet his whole life, uh, was not taught, was not allowed to do certain things, was abused on a daily basis. Um, there's a, a lot of cases of feral children that, again, as I mentioned, one, they were either raised by the wild, or two, were raised just in a in an enclosed environment, in a box, in a closet, uh, were never taught human types of functions, okay, human types of things that you would think are just common sense for most of us, such as what is a sunrise, what is a sunset, how do where do plants grow, how do plants grow. Uh, what is water? Where do I live? Little things that we take for granted as as normal human beings. Not everybody, unfortunately, um, had access to these. And it appears that, you know, again, the fact that these two children were able to, um, their skin color returned to normal after they were fed a more of a normal diet, uh, consisting of actual normal food, rather than maybe uh, a malnutritious diet, I think that says exactly that they probably were suffering from chlorosis. And uh, unfortunately, again, people of the Middle Ages of the 12th century, they didn't know too much about diseases, of course. Um, science was not as advanced as it is now where we can categorize these diseases for what they are, uh, truly medical conditions. We know about, of course, which you know, witchcraft and... Uh, how that was perceived as a disease, and a lot of people died for those reasons. Uh, even um, lycanthropy, right? We know about some individuals who have excessive body hair, um, and who maybe it, during um, the during certain bouts of the month would exhibit very violent behavior. And a lot of people again attributed this to werewolves. I think it's also very interesting that this concept of uh, wolf pit, you know, wolf pit, wolf pit. Uh, children emerging from the wolf pit, uh, almost as if you're transforming from uh, wherever you came from to wherever you are now. This whole concept of transformation, again, um, kind of comes up, it's it's a theme that comes up very often, um, like a werewolf, right? So these these children came from a land where the sun did not rise so high, nor did it set so low. Or um, And again, you're talking about a transformation from that type of uh, sun situation to into what what we are now, what where, what they saw on Earth. I think it's very interesting that you do have those connections. And um, if you if you get again on, in the Wikipedia site, um, there is actually a very very uh, brief explanation from a um, a historian named Derek Brewer who kind of basically is agreeing with what I'm saying, and this is what his uh, explanation is for the story of the children. He says, quote, 
The likely core of the matter is that these very small children, herding or following flocks, strayed from their forest village, spoke little, and in modern terms, did not know their home address. They were probably suffering from chlorosis, a deficiency disease which gives the skin a greenish tint. Hence the term green sickness. With a better diet, it disappears. So he summed, he summed part of it up in a couple of sentences, basically what these children were experiencing. Um, now, the idea of emerging from a wolf pit, however, either the children hid in the wolf pit, maybe they got lost while doing some, uh, again, some, some herding of a flock of sheep, uh, and in order to spend the night somewhere, they basically uh, got into the wolf pit to hide. So that is one explanation of how they, they emerged from it. So people basically saw them emerge from the wolf pit, and they attributed that to, for them having actually come from underneath the earth. That's where they came from. Uh, but I think also, you know, it, it is kind of interesting that this concept of children appearing out of nowhere um, and coming and looking for help or, again, it is kind of connected to the uh, black-eyed kids phenomena, as I had mentioned uh, earlier in today's episode, where we do have, again, this... I think it's one thing for adults to appear out of nowhere, and you would think of, of an adult as acting like an adult, somebody who acts like, acts more maturely. But when you have children appearing out of nowhere, you tend to want to help them, of course. So obviously, that's the whole situation with the black-eyed kids, where individuals are very, very easily convinced to open the door when you're confronted with a black-eyed kid situation. Uh, and the reason being is because we, I think it's inherent in, in us as humans. We tend to want to help the helpless. And we think of children as not being able to fend for themselves. So in this case, the same situation. The town came in. Uh, again, one of the individuals, her name was Agnes, the, the girl of, of, of the pair. And the story says that she went on to marry. So we do have even cases now of individuals that were born feral children. Would I, I clearly remember one case of, of a girl who was basically raised by, I don't, I don't want to sound too cliche-ish, but raised by wolves. And um, she learned to, she basically walked on all fours. Uh, she didn't know how to walk bipedally. So she had to learn to walk on all four, on bipedally. Um, but again, it cost her a lot of effort. And I don't think she ever lived a normal life afterwards. But there's also another story of, a, of an alleged person who, I don't know if this is entirely true, but the story is that this female um, was born of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a union, of, a, of a, some kind of unknown cryptid, I don't want to say Bigfoot, and human, uh, and a homo sapien, and she just, she looked really bizarre because she had lived in the forest her whole life, and then one day she was found, uh, they, they quote-unquote domesticated her, and she went on to get married and have a whole bunch of children, and all of those children had children, and then so forth. So you have a lot of lineage of that individual that um, allegedly, again, went on to live a normal life. We don't know much about Agnes after, after she got married in Lynn, uh, but we do know, again, that the story that comes from uh, Thomas Newber that does talk about her being married. Uh, the story from Cogshall does not. And Cogshall's story is, is, was written earlier. Uh, William of Newber, Newbridge's story was written six years afterwards. Uh, but again, I think it's interesting that you have the story in two different uh, historical texts, uh, that of Kolkshall and of uh, Newbridge, Newber. Uh, I think that spelling of Newber and Newbridge, it's different too. Uh, depending on the source, it's spelled a little bit differently. So could we say, what could we say, what could we conclude about the story? To use Carl Sagan's words, and I use them quite often in this podcast, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And in the opinion of yours truly, unfortunately, it is, you don't really have much evidence in favor of the uh, interdimensional wormhole, um, other world visitors type of story. Uh, there is no evidence at all in favor of that. You do have some interesting coincidences, but those coincidences can be explained 
in terms of a medical condition, one, two, sadly, a situation of possible abuse. And that basically can, you, you can attribute all of those things. Ultimately, the source is probably these children came from a, uh, probably from an abused area, an abused family. Um, or again, to maybe make it a little bit more on a, on a lighter note, either that or they just, they got lost and were lost for a while. Literally so long that they were probably just trying to feed off whatever they could find which led to their malnutrition. Of course, we know children. I mean, I have children need um, a lot of important nutritious food in order to grow, probably more than an adult, because obviously an adult is full grown, full grown adult. Children, not so much, or they're still growing. So they need a particular set of nutrients and vitamins in order to grow and to be healthy. Uh, these children appear to be a mal in a malnutrition state. So either they were pur purposefully not being fed, or they might have just gotten lost. Which makes you think again, though, if they were truly lost, uh, and if it, it appeared that maybe if their parents were around, you know, why didn't their parents come around and find them? And what is it about this St. Martin's land? Um, if, if they didn't veer too far off, because again, we're talking two children, how, how far could they have gone from home? Why is it that the people of Woolpit had never heard of St. Martin's Land? Because that is another part of the story. They didn't know where St. Martin's Land was. Um, so that's, that is a mysterious aspect of the story, I have to say. Where did they come up with this term, St. Martin's Land? You can't explain that away. But I'd say 75% of the um, characteristics and elements of the story can be explained using just the the aspect of these children were lost or they came from a an abusive situation at home and they were trying to get away from it or they got lost getting away from it and they happened to um, run into Woolpit and in Woolpit they were able to um, come out of their situation which again to these individuals in Woolpit going back to this topic this notion of peasant superstitions it appeared that these children were from another world, literally. They looked and they behaved like they were, from another, they were from another world. But the explanation maybe is more mundane. So I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Um, and I uh, hope everybody is continuing to enjoy their summer. I'm not sure what I'll cover next, but rest assured, it'll be something done in a very analytical and hopefully objective way. So I wish everybody a great weekend. And... As always, question everything.